If it's Thursday, we must be doing a live stream, and we are, so that works out. Happy Thursday, and happy very soon to be Valentine's Day. Um, getting this project ahead of you with time for you to still pull together the few supplies and work on this. So in the world of supplies, if you're gonna make this project, there is a PDF, and Max has a link for this right on the page where you're watching this. What the PDF is gonna give you, the most important thing is, let me get to it. There's a pattern in there for this shape. Uh, so printing the PDF and using the pattern is gonna be the easiest way to get to this point. When you do this, when you print the PDF, a couple of things, the pattern is full size here. So you don't need to try to expand it or contract it or anything. Of course, if you wanna make it larger or smaller, you're welcome to do that. But the concept in my world was to make this full size so you don't have to do that. But you need to print two of these because otherwise you're gonna have a broken heart. You'd only have half. So um, when you print it one, the first time, you can just stick with this. Then you're gonna print it again and cut this out because we gotta be able to flip this. We need a mirror image. So we get two halves. So here's what I think we're gonna do. Here's how we're gonna do this. One, if you have questions as we go, get them posted there in the chat roll. Max will get them in front of me. I will be looking for those on my telephono. And then um, we're gonna start here with just a little bit of work at the bench. Then we're gonna go to the bandsaw and we're gonna cut. Then we're gonna come back to the bench and we're gonna finish this. And to expedite this, like I always do with projects, there are hearts under my table in various stages of completion. So um, we'll, that'll let us move through this without you like watching paint dry, literally, as we go through the steps. Overview of the project, it's pretty simple. Um, we're gonna cut a shape. You could cut out the heart and be done there because just the heart is kind of cool. My, when I was thinking about this though, what I was going after, what I was emulating are those, um, whatever they're called, those kind of disgusting little candies that you can buy at Valentine's Day that all have the little message on them. So what would be fun would be to make a bunch of these and put slightly different text on each one. And that gives you, you know, when you spill those all out of the box and they have whatever, they have all their different sayings on them, that's what you would have. Material selection, I'm using cherry. And I picked that because it's got a little bit of a red tone to it. Um, a great wood for this would be blood wood is as red as the day is long. It's a, it's a hardwood, but it's not a hard wood. It's pretty easy to work with. So that would give you a very cool look because it would be really, really red. And again, that's blood wood. Um, other than that, whatever you've got, you know, if, if you currently have pine in your shop, that's good to go. One of the things we're gonna be using is a spray adhesive. And uh, we're gonna use that just to get the pattern on the material. Y you don't have to do this. Another approach would be, you could cut out both halves of the heart and then put them on here and trace the outside with a pencil. And then just let that, then you've got a pencil line on there. You don't need the paper on here. My preferred method is spray adhesive, stick the paper on and leave it on, and then I just cut to the paper instead of tracing a line. For me, and maybe it's just like, I don't know, my hands aren't good at stuff, it's hard for me to trace paper because it's so thin. It's hard to get the pencil to follow that. So I would prefer to just adhere this right to the material. Um, I'm gonna look quick to see if there are any preliminary preguntas. All right, nothing yet. So, um, I don't think we need to zoom in yet because this is pretty straightforward. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the full sheet, half heart, spray the back,
and stick this down about approximately centered on my material. And I've got the, the like long direction, this part of the heart, I've got parallel to the grain of the wood. So when you're done, the heart, the grain here is going up and down in the final one. Then with this guy, I'm gonna spray glue on the back of this. And then when this goes on, I'm just looking to align that edge with the line on there. That's how I'm getting that to play nice together. And I'll show you that up close when we head for the bandsaw. So the edge of piece number two, right on the line of piece number one, heart number one, and stick that down. And I've got that. Now in a preemptive strike, because I bet people are gonna ask this, um, I'm using the bandsaw because I own a bandsaw, and that's a very easy way to do this. If you own a scroll saw, you could very easily cut three quarter inch stock on a scroll saw, and it's just gonna go slower. If all you own is a handheld jigsaw, you could do all of this with a handheld jigsaw. That's gonna be fine. So there are a number of different ways to do the cut, and that's part of the reason that I stayed with thinner material, three quarter inch stock is just to simplify that, that if you don't have a bandsaw, um, that you could use other tools to make this happen. I'm gonna be using a quarter inch, four tooth per inch blade on the bandsaw. And as typically happens with bandsaw work, we're gonna follow it with sanding. So I'm looking to get close to the line, but cut outside the line, because then there are gonna be bandsaw marks. And after the bandsaw work is done, I wanna have a little bit of room to sand to the line so that I can clean that up. If you're doing this on a jigsaw, you should do it the same way. Leave a little bit of waste wood to sand back to the line because you'll have jigsaw marks. If you do this on a scroll saw, the, the cut quality off scroll saws is typically pretty amazing. So with a scroll saw, it'd be more likely that you could, um, you could just cut right to the line. And part of the benefit, although the cutting is slower on a scroll saw, you won't have to sand the outside shape after you're done. All right, I'm just looking for questions one more time before I make a bunch of noise with the bandsaw. Oh, what do we got? Dennis is in West Virginia. Their bill is asking what blade we're using. Um, and again, it's a quarter inch four tooth per inch blade. Um, and then Alan asks, is there a particular spray adhesive that works better than others? Good question. So I will, um, when I'm done with this, I'll put a link for this particular product in the comments on WWGOA page. I know this is streaming in multiple spots. Um, this particular one is, it's called a repositional repositionable adhesive. So what I would not use, this stuff, this is a great spray adhesive, 3M Super 77. This is pretty permanent. So the difference is, if you use that 3M product, you're gonna work harder to get the paper off of here. With this stuff, which is called Easy Tack, with Easy Tack, when we're done, the paper peels pretty easily, hence the name. Um, so it's it's much easier to do the cleanup. But I will I'll get a link for that uh, when we're done. Sorry, I forgot to do that before. And Bill says you could even use a coping saw and cut by hand. Woo! Who would do such a thing? No, that's um, I I make fun sometimes of hand tool woodworking, but um, yes. You could definitely cut this by hand. And you know, how about this? If like kids in your life are looking for a Valentine's gift for the parent in their life, that would be a great way to get kids involved with this would be by doing the cuts with a handsaw, with a coping saw, instead of with a power tool. That'd be very cool. Uh, Eric says, what kind of blade on a jigsaw? 
fine tooth. Um, I don't have that number in front of me the way I do with bandsaw blades, um, but just um, wood cutting blade as opposed to a metal cutting, that would be too fine. And then um, just a fine tooth kind. A lot of times it'll say on the package like scrolling blade, which would be more like what we're looking for here so that we get a good surface finish. So it's not, we don't want the blade in here that you would use to hack through a two by four if you're doing building construction in your house. Um, we want something that's finer tooth than that. So let me, um, let me do this, stay where you are. I'm coming right back, coming right back, coming right back. Coming right back, stay there. I grabbed my package of jigsaw blades. And if there's one here, yeah, unfortunately it doesn't, it says on the blade clean cuts in hardwood. It does not say what the tooth count is. Um, when I zoom you in, I'll zoom you in on this blade. When I zoom you into the bandsaw, I'll show you the tooth count. I'll show you the teeth on this blade. That would be a good choice for this. But unfortunately, it doesn't have the TPI. Okay, I think we're ready to cut. So I gotta get you. There ish. And then let's do the blade first. So pretty fine tooth count. If I were speculating, I would say, I would guesstimate that's about a 10 TPI blade. And like I said, it says on this other face, see that? It's a little harder to glare. Clean cuts in hardwood. So that's, that's what you're looking for. Not a lot of technique going on here other than cutting outside to leave wood to sand. What I am gonna do is I'm gonna do a relief cut first from the end of the board into the V right there. And that way when I come around, boop, that half will fall off. Then I can come around, boop, that half will fall off. I'm gonna get rid of my fence so I don't run into that. A relief cut to there and same with the jigsaw I would do the same thing because the easiest place to start the cut is down here at the point and then come around start at the point come around and if you end up in that V with the jigsaw or a bandsaw you'd have to back out to get away from that doing the relief cut first simplifies this a lot and take away everything that doesn't look like a heart And it feels like there should be some use for that. I don't know what.
see the benefit of having that relief cut, then the waste has some place to go. There we go. All right, now we're going to go back to the bench. So let me... To look for questions again before we go anywhere. Okay. Sanding. There are like 11 billion ways you could do this. Um, if you've got a, uh, a spindle sander, you could be doing a lot of this with the spindle sander. You wouldn't get into that V but you could do this, 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 all the way down to here. I found in making a few of these that a random orbit sander honestly works fine. So what I'm angling for here is, <laughs> I'm trying to get my, uh, my pad, my router pad here where you can see. Who planned this? Oh, me. All right. I want the router pad so that I've got a soft surface to set this on when I'm working on it. And with the random orbit, all I'm going to do is work around this edge. And then I found that if I cantilever this over the edge, which would be hard for you to see, that's why I'm describing it, that's going to let me use the random orbit this way and get into the V of the heart like this. And then, so that worked on this side. If I flip, I can do the same over here. And then it's just mucho mas of the same, more and more of the same. I'm with a, I'm on 120 grit sandpaper right now, and I would sand this up to 220. So with the one or yeah, with the 120, take out all the bandsaw marks, kind of fare your curves. Fairing the curves means bringing this into one flowing curve all the way around as much as you can. Don't jump grits until all the bandsaw marks are out or you're just going to get frustrated. If you go to a finer grit too soon, you're going to feel like you're sanding, 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 sanding and not getting the bandsaw marks up. So stick at 100 or 120 until you've taken out the jigsaw marks or the bandsaw marks. Then graduate from there. Now, through the beauty of preparation, sand, sand, sand. Oh, look, all the sanding is done. Isn't that nice? Now, next, we're going to put some text on here. In your packet, I feel like I'm talking really loud, probably because I had earplugs in. Um, in your packet, I gave you Be Mine text. All I did for this was go in Word, picked a font, and wrote that, picked a size, printed it. You can do the same thing. You can test different fonts. You can test different sizes. Um, and obviously test different text. You can write whatever you want to write. Um, what I would do is keep it simple. Because what we're going to do, the way I'm going to do this, is I'm going to use a handheld router freehand in order to make the letters. So if you get into some really curvy script, 
that's very cool or has a chance to be cool, but you're also probably making your life kind of complex. Another way to do this is don't worry about this. So let me back up a step. If you're going to do this, you would now take your text, spray adhesive, and just stick that to the heart. And then we're going to trace that with a router. Or another approach is do whatever you want to do just with hand created letters. So, you know, too, again, if you got a kid doing this in the shop, it could be kind of fun to just let the kid within reason write whatever they want to write. Don't put the Constitution on here because that would be a lot of routing to do. Um, but your simple message. So what I'm going to do is I am going to um, I'm going to just handwrite my text. I'm going to write love. So I'm eyeballing. There's the center of the heart. I want it to go across. So I'm going to do. Lowercase e. Something like that. Then I'm going to zoom you because I want you to be able to see this router bit. And making sure, as always, that we're caught up on questions or I'm caught up on questions. Okay. So router bit choice for me is an eighth inch bit. This particular one, more specifically, is an up cut spiral. The up cut spiral part isn't critical. The diameter, I think, is. You want to stick with a small bit, otherwise it's going to be very difficult to control freehand. When you look at it this way, depth of cut is only an eighth of an inch. Same thing. If you try to go too deep with this, it's going to be really hard to control the cut. So you want to have a small diameter bit. You want to have a shallow depth of cut. You could also do this with a V-bit instead of a instead of a one-eighth diameter, you could do a 60 degree V bit, same thing. Keep your depth of cut light so that it's easy to control this when you're doing this freehand. What I'm gonna do is again, I'm on the router mat so the board can't slide around on me. I'll turn the router on, get on that letter and then when I move this, one of the things to notice is I'm going to let my hands rest on the work and on the bench. And I'm going to move the router with my fingers. So basically, as much as possible, I'm going to anchor the heels of my hands. And I'm going to use my fingers to move the router. That's going to give you better control. If your hands are off and you're using all of your arms and your shoulders to move the router, that's... Your arms are good at really big movements. Your fingers are better at fine movements. You don't, you don't play piano by going like this. You Maybe some people do, but you should play piano by going like this. Same thing, better control. So I'm going to turn the router on, get on the letter. And keep in mind, you're doing a nice little handcrafted Valentine's thing here. So, you know, if you wander a little, it's even more handcrafted. I'm trying to get centered. I gotta I gotta move my camera just a little bit. And there's nothing wrong if you've not done this before practice all of it practice this part on some scrap wood not the heart you just cut and sanded here we go Thank you.
Hands are anchored. Fingers are doing the movement. Zoom, zoom. There you go. Now, before we do the next step, right now, from the routing, this is a little fuzzy wuzzy. This is a little bit fuzzy. Grab your random orbit. And just buzz over the top of that so that you can take the fuzziness out. We also need the dust out of there. So either, if that works, or air compressor. Then, we're briefly done with the pad. And the next thing to highlight those, a rattle can of paint, which this is, a, this is an optional step. Because you can see the letters. I just like seeing them more better by giving them a shot of paint. One of the benefits to using the printout from your um, from a computer is you would have paper on here and the next step would go a little faster. So make sure you've got when you hit it with paint, I'm just double checking to make sure there's paint in the bottom of each letter. And then time goes by, no, 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 and the paint dries. And then once the paint is dry, we're back to your random orbit sander. <laughs> and knock the excess paint off the surface. I have just a little bit more to go there. Um, knock the excess paint off the surface. And like I said, it just, it really does a nice job of highlighting the letters. Here on the face, last step. And again, you know, there's a lot of uh, beauty in the eye of the beholder here. If you're happy with how this looks and you wanna be done, you can be done. I like going another step. That's a quarter inch round over bit. And I'm gonna buzz that around the outside here and just um, round it over. I'm gonna ease that corner. And I like the little rounded look of that. I'll show you. I love the break on that router. And I think that just gives it, it gives it a little bit more of a finished look. On the back, if you wanna hang this on a wall, easiest way to make that happen is grab a ruler. And unfortunately the lead broke right on my pencil or I'd be using my pencil. But what I'm doing is I'm using the ruler to go from the V on the top internal V on the top, external V on the bottom, and use a pencil, draw a little line. That's the center. And then grab a drill. And 
And if you need to put masking tape or a drill stop on here, do that. We just want to punch a little hole in here and not go all the way through. Just enough that you can hang that on a wall. Got one of those. Got one of those. Oh, running into my cord. Because I don't have a gaffer in the shop. Okay. What do you think? Very simple. I mean, in real time, if I wasn't explaining this, um, you can make these hearts really, really, really quickly. And um, like I said, what would be cute is if a little bit different text was on each one and then you had a number of these to give. Um, oh, so unrelated question. Other than buying another piece of lumber, do you have recommendations on fixing dado cuts that are too wide? Um, you can fill the dado, glue a chunk of wood in there and then recut the dado. So like plug it, plug the existing dado, cut a new dado. Are you going to any of the woodworking shows in 2023? I might go to, um, I might go to Milwaukee, because that's close to me, uh, relatively close, five hours. Um, but um, no set plans at this time. I'm very intrigued by, um, so the woodworking shows, which has been around forever. I taught at the woodworking shows as far back as like 93, 94, so nearly 30 years ago. Um, there's a new gig called the Woodworking Expo, I think that's right. And there are a lot of those. There, there are none in this area, uh, Minneapolis or Milwaukee. Um, but they're doing a lot of venues. I feel like, I think Chuck Bender might be behind that. Look it up. Um, so anyway, I'm intrigued by that. But um, at this point, um, I don't have any teaching gigs set up at any of those shows. Eric says difference between an upcut and a router, and an upcut and downcut router bit. We've got a great video on this on GOA. And bottom line, um, I own CNCs, and um, there's some application in CNC work to do downcut. Um, it's just what it sounds like. The the flutes spin the other way. Router bit spins in the same direction, but the flutes are going the other way. So when you cut, it's pushing everything down toward the bit. So a good example would be when we did these letters and they were fuzzed on the top of the material, um, upcut router bit, which the flutes go the same way as a drill bit, with an upcut router bit, you're more likely to get that fuzzing or in a real fragile wood, like a bird's eye maple veneer, you might get chipping. The chipping is what would cause one to want to use a down cut bit. So I bring up the CNCs because I own like 11 billion up cut router bits and I own about two down cut router bits. And they're just not a boatload of application for them in my world. But their, their big thing is if you work with fragile surface material, the down cut um, is less prone to chip in that. Bill says, good recommendation on using your fingers to move the router. Yeah, thanks. And, and honestly, I didn't talk about it at the bandsaw, but it's really the same thing here. I'm not, um, I'm not back here making movements with my arms. I'm anchoring my hands when I'm making those movements with my fingers to get that finer control. So it's really anytime, um, very frequently with a handheld router, same when I'm using a dovetail jig, um, I teach this and that video is anchor your hands and just let your fingers move the router back and forth on a dovetail jig, but really critical with our fine movement on this. Um, 
backing up, what grit did you use to sand the heart? So I started, if you were bandsaw or jigsaw on the edge, I started with 120. See how that goes for you? Maybe you gotta go down to 100, depends on your bandsaw work or jigsaw work. But um, somewhere around there, 100 or 120 is gonna be a good starting point. And then don't graduate to the next grit until you get the all of the machine marks off, or you're just gonna get frustrated. Um, yeah, and somebody says you could practice routing on junk wood before using the good wood. Yeah, and that's that thing I mentioned is um, don't don't break your heart by breaking your heart. So don't uh, if if you're not confident with freehand routing that text, it definitely pays to spend some time messing around on a piece of scrap wood. Now I will say this: if you're gonna if you're fixing to route cherry, I would practice on cherry because there's a hardness factor here compared to um, pine. If you practice on pine, the cherry is gonna feel different from the pine. So it, whatever your target wood is to do the routing in, use scrap of that to do your practice cuts. The other thing is if you own a Dremel, you could, um, or you know, a rotary tool, it's like calling all facial tissue Kleenex. If you own a rotary tool, you could put a cutting burr in a rotary tool, like a Dremel, and you could trace the letters with the Dremel instead of doing this with a router. That, you know, they're kind of bulky, but that would give you a little bit more of a pen in your fingers kind of a feel. And um, for me, if I had a 12 year old in my shop doing this, I would more likely hand them a Dremel than I would a router bit. And I think they would also have greater success with that. And at the end of the day, you just need enough of a relief from those letters that you can read the letters. You don't have to go all that deep. But a Dremel would be um, a Dremel would be a good alternative. Mark says, "Looks like a good kid project." I agree. I, I, I mean, my kids use the bandsaw at a young age, um, probably ten ish. So I'd be comfortable letting them cut the heart shape on a bandsaw, provided they, you know, my kids were already using it a lot before this. Um, so provided they have some experience, you're supervising, obviously. Um, certainly on a scroll saw, a kid could run a scroll saw. Certainly a coping saw, a kid could do that. Um, and then too, you know, I don't use them much because I kind of forget they exist, but wood rasps, are a great way, would also be a great way to clean up the edge. So if a kid starts this and does it with a coping saw and the edge is a little bit jaggedy from that handwork, starting with a rasp instead of sandpaper would be a great idea to get those curves to flow together better before you start sanding. Uh, Dave says, final grit, are you sanding to 220? throughout so this was this finish this has lacquer on it 220 on the edges 220 on the faces what are downside using three eight spit and trim routers uh i mean i wouldn't do a three eight spit for this you'd never be able to control it freehand Keith says, are you using Cubitron sanding discs? I don't know. Purple. I'm using purple ones. This has been on there a little bit, so it's got a brand name on the back that I can't read. I don't, I don't specifically remember. Oh, it's a 3M product. There, now I can read it. And yes, so good eye. It does say 3M Cubitron on it. So yes, is the answer to that. What I like is, I mean, the abrasive seems fine, but these particular discs have like 11 billion holes in them. Of no, I mean, obviously it's a set pattern, but it's not a set pattern like, oh, you have a DeWalt eight hole random orbit. You have, uh, Black and Decker five hole random orbit. You have a Festool nine hole random orbit, all of which I own. So with this, I'm buying one sandpaper, one hole pattern, 
And these discs are going on every random orbit sander I own, regardless of its hole pattern. So um, I like the universality of the hole pattern. Okay, I think we're there. Um, so let me think a second, and then I'm just kind of tap dancing to see if any more questions pop up. But um, no four o'clock live stream today, because it's not that kind of a Thursday. The next one of those will be in February. Um, if you are in the Sioux Falls, South Dakota area, I'll be at the Stan Houston store um, February 17th, whatever that weekend is. I've got two classes a day for two days at the Stan Houston Woodworking Show. Um, so I'll see you there. If you're looking for cabinet making, I'm at the Mark Adams School in Indiana uh, the week preceding Memorial Day. So that's May, right? I think that's the last week in May. There's a five day cabinet making class there that I'll be teaching. And then, um, see, another question popped up. In regard to sanding grit, is there any time you really need to go finer than 320? I, I rarely go beyond 220. So, um, and I always say with finishing, I'm, I am the least finishing expert ever. You know, I, I've, I've got a system that works for me um, and that system includes the level to which I sand. So for me, sanding to 320 and then using the finish I use um, works. So there might be benefits to more sanding that other people do, but um, it's just not a level I take my sanding to. All right, is that all the news that's fit to print? Jessica says, you're a great teacher. Thank you very much. Love the show and thanks. So yeah, thanks, Jessica. It's um, it's what I do. <laughs> I've, been, uh, I've been doing woodworking for a really, really long time and teaching for a really, really long time. So I appreciate the, uh, I appreciate the positive comment. Other than that, Max, I think we're maxed out. See what I did there? All right, Max, I think you can shut us off and uh, I'll see you folks when we do this again in a couple of weeks.